talking tonight on walking in wisdom. And speaking of guarding the heart, we want to talk about, uh, in fact, there's an old saying that I think will, will help us out tonight. There's an old saying that says home is where the heart is. And the home is not just the place where you spend your time, okay? The home is not just a place where you are most of the time, even though you are at home. The home is the center of your life. The home is where you develop your personal disciplines. Uh, the home is where you uh, work on raising your children and shaping their future. Your home is where you come to rest and recuperate. Your home is where you find yourself going for strength when there's nowhere else to go. The home is that place. And now for us, the, we have to understand that the home is one of the three central structures, if you will, of the, the Christian's life. The home is a central part of the Christian's life because it's one of the three central structures that God created for society, okay? You, those three structures are the home that God creates in the book of Genesis when he puts Adam and Eve together, okay? So you, you have the home, and then not only do you have the home, but you also have the church, Okay, the church, of course, is made up of homes. And then the church is what shapes society. It ought to be. Many have called the church the conscience of society. Now, we could talk about that, about how true that is, how uh, or the nuances of that. But the fact is, where there are weak homes, where homes are not what they need to be, then the church will not be what it needs to be. And where the church is not what it needs to be, then morality in a culture, in a nation, will crumble. Right now, we're looking at a world where we, guys, we are reaping what we have sowed as a nation. We are reaping what we've sown. But here's the thing. When, when the churches deteriorated, the nation deteriorates. But before the churches deteriorated, individual homes were deteriorating in their morality, in their dedication to God, and so on and so forth. And so we see that as a major part of uh, this journey is understanding the value of that home structure. And I truly wish that we would have more uh, families that would take time being intentional, especially in the early years of forming their homes. Now, let's look at what the scripture says about the home. Proverbs chapter 11, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 29 says, he who troubles his own house will inherit the wind and the fool will be a servant to the heart of the wise. Now, what this is saying is no person that is reckless in their home life is going to gain anything of lasting value. Oh, you'll have an inheritance. Your inheritance will be the wind. Well, what value is the wind? You can't hold it. You can't capture it. You can't do any of those things. And so we have to be careful in what we do in our home, whether what we're doing in our home life is troubling our home life or building. Remember, we read a scripture a couple weeks ago where we talked about how that the wise build their home and the fool tears their home down. Now, the believer is typically going to have trouble in a few areas in their life. Okay, there's a, a couple things that typically point to trouble in the life of a believer. Number one is devotional lack. Okay, when a believer is lacking in their devotion life, you're going to find issues in that believer's life. Also, uh, their relationships. And we talked about the relationships and friendships and being careful that we have proper relationships and friendships. When we have wrong relationships, whether they're our romantic relationships or our platonic or our friendship relationships, they, those can cause great trouble for us. And uh, another thing, obviously, would be the home life. But here's the thing. Oftentimes, if you fix your devotional lack and if you fix your relationships then that will begin to fix the home life. I can't tell you how many people come in, they have issues, and you get down to the bottom of it, the bottom of it is somebody wasn't praying, somebody wasn't reading, somebody wasn't seeking God, 
or somebody in the home has been connected with people that don't value home or or that are giving them bad advice and that affects the home. So oftentimes that devotional lack and those relationships will affect the home. And so we're going to look at all three of those areas. But but one great example that we find of the power of home life is actually in Timothy. Now, I know we think Proverbs has all the wisdom about home life and it has much but, but I want us to notice something. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now remember, Timothy is a young minister who has come up under the spiritual fatherhood of Paul. And Paul writes First and 2 Timothy as letters to this minister to help him try to gain an understanding, if you will, of what his life needs to be as a, a, a minister. And so Paul is laid out to young Timothy all the things that Timothy needs to be doing, or, or, or a majority, or, or, a, or a large portion of them, rather, we would say. And so let's look at what the Scripture says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 says, But continue in the things that you have learned and have been assured of, knowing those from whom you have learned them, and that since childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, we read that scripture and it says, scripture that you have known, look at it one more time, since childhood, you've known these scriptures. So how in the world did Timothy get this knowledge about the scriptures? And maybe you can drop in the comments, how did Timothy, where did Timothy learn this information about the scriptures? Did Paul teach him? Did he go to seminary? Uh, was he uh, a Jew that he had this instruction coming up? What? Where, where did Timothy learn the scriptures? Where did he get this information? What made him the strong young man in the Lord he was? Drop your answer in the comments if you've got one. And we're going to go look at the scripture We're actually going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Remembering the genuine faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and that I am persuaded lives in you also. Now, Paul looks at him and says, Timothy, I know you've got it in you because I know what was in your mother. I know what was in your grandmother. And Miss Kim Williams put from his upbringing. That's exactly right. He was raised up knowing these things, being taught these things. And so the, the, the number one value, the first value is that home is where, home is where we find ourselves raising our children, shaping those arrows. Sandra Hannon from his mother and grandmother, absolutely. And so we know, we know that home is where Timothy was shaped, but home is where we shape our children. Home is where we begin to instill the word into our children. Now, what are some ways that we can do that? What are some ways that, uh, that, that we can go about doing it? Uh, well, first of all, daily prayer. Your children, every day, there should be prayer. Now, there's some of you may not have children at home. You have to ask the question, is there prayer every day at home, whether or not you have children? But if you have children, now you're going to have to go age appropriate. I, now, there are people out there that would probably say, you know, let, bring your kids into your prayer time. My, my kids, I don't know about yours, but my kids aren't, aren't going aren't gonna to deal with a, a elongated prayer time. But have, a, have a, uh, an age appropriate prayer time with your children. Uh, there are many resources that are available. There are children's Bibles. There are children's devotions. We, in fact, just got some books and a devotional plan for our, our girls uh, just in the last week or two to start teaching them about some of the women of the Bible. Hey, they've got all these Disney princesses that they know. Why not know the women in the Bible? And so that's one of the things that, that we wanted to do was to be able to, uh, to teach them through uh, uh, these books and these resources. Eric says, be the example at home. Absolutely. Hypocrisy at home will destroy children. It will destroy them. They begin to see hypocrisy in parents. Next thing you know, they're not going to have any confidence in anybody. They're not going to have confidence in the God 
that they thought people believed in either. So there's resources that are available. That daily prayer, uh, one thing that we do with our children, we do a catechism. Now, that's something that I'm looking to actually write and release uh, I've taken some, pulled from some other resources, and there's some doctrinal things that might be different, a lot of them that are available. But the idea that uh, we can sit down with our girls and ask them the questions, you know, where is God? What can God do? Well, he can do all this holy will. What is sin? Uh, what do you mean by lack of conformity to uh, what God desires? All these different questions that we go through. We're talking about redemption, and they're learning doctrine. And there came a point where Reagan one night we're at the dinner table. She wants to start talking about God. And we were able to, through the things we had learned, through going through that catechism with her, we were able to have a conversation with her where she had doctrinal understanding at five years old. And my three-year-old will repeat these questions and answer them. We're building understanding. We're putting those things there. And it's not be, it, that's not me saying that to brag on my kids or to brag on us because it's very simple. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. Um kind of like my kids like to watch ratatouille and the the chef on there says anybody can cook well anyone can can teach their children these things it's just a matter of putting the time in conversation have conversations that talk about god that talk about things of god with your children with your young people your kids start becoming teenagers have a conversation with them here's the thing don't just come to don't just wait for them to come to you with questions and then and then at that point try to you know tell them that they shouldn't be questioning the faith but have ongoing conversations with them about the things of God. Uh, there are the, the guides that we provided when we had our, our children's vision nights uh, for parents that had kids in the youth and children's department. We provided guides, resources that told you things to be doing with your children at particular times. And so we uh, want you to take advantage of using those resources. If you need those resources, let us know. We'll get some things in your hand. And so those are all important things about our children. Now, there's a lot of you watching that are going, Pastor, I don't have kids, so what in the world are you telling me all this stuff about children for? Well, here's the thing. No, no doubt uh, his mother and grandmother were great influence on him. No doubt they were. I don't. We don't doubt that for, for a minute. However, even though they were a great influence on him, that is not the totality of what shaped his life. In fact, he had to have known something of the word through his own personal devotions as well. Um, now, here's the thing. It, maybe you attend church and you go, all right, I attend church and pastor, that's your job to teach me the word. Well, absolutely. And I'm going to do everything I can to feed you the word. And I'm going to study and I'm going to put out resources and the church is going to do all those things. But ultimately, you can only gain so much knowledge from being exposed to the word for an hour on Wednesday night, 40 minutes on Sunday morning. You're only going to learn so much when you're only hearing it twice a week. To truly know the Word, there has to be personal study time in between when you're at church. And Timothy, knowing the Word as a child, must have known something of personal devotions, and that's what grew him. In fact, if you watch, if you look at what Paul advises, watch what Paul says. Paul says, study to show yourself approved. A workman approved by God, a workman who needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, we understand this is written to a young minister. However, we all have a role to play in the guidance of our homes in winning the lost. We are all called to ministry. There isn't like a set of things that the pastor needs to do. It's There, there is... Uh, um, uh, a dedication to the word that needs to be into the life of everyone. It, it just, it has to be there. Now, Kim Williams puts, it's a personal relationship and absolutely right. And in order to have a relationship, we have to have a constant connection. Okay. We have to have, we're not going to ignore what someone's speaking to us and then call that a relationship. And so let me ask you, what would happen if you neglected food and water? If you stopped eating and drinking, uh, you would end up. You would get physically weak. You would have greater susceptibility to diseases, as your immune system would go down. Eventually, there would be death, and the same things are involved spiritually. When you're not being fed spiritually, you will get weaker. You will be more prone to falsehood, to disease, the disease of false doctrine and untruth. And on top of that, you're going to find yourself 
uh, dying spiritually. You're going to get weak. You're going to be overrun in battle. And you could actually have absolute spiritual death. And that is uh, that that is simply what happens when a person allows themselves to go without spiritual food. Christine says you have to put in work, and, and you know, and it's that that's a good point. And a lot of times when people hear that, they're going to go, "Oh, you got what do you mean works? We're not saved by works. We're not talking about being saved by works. We're talking about being strong by putting in the study, study to show yourself approved by God, a workman." And so what would happen, again, if we neglected spiritual things, we'd become weak. And a lot of Christians are weak. They don't know the truth. I talk to people oftentimes, and I go, oh, what makes you think that's okay? And then I discover they're not reading the Word. A lot of the things that plague us, a lot of the ways people respond to things, the ways people handle their situations, there, there are things, ways that people live and lifestyles that people are in that if they didn't, if they were reading the word, there's no way they could be in those lifestyles. They would know better than to be in those lifestyles. Here's the thing. You know, here's a question for you. What if you ate as often as you studied the word? Would you be alive? What if you only ate one meal for every time of devotion you had had? Some of us are going, man, we'd be in a lot better shape than we are. But physically, that might be because we've been blessed with an overabundance of food. And spiritually, we've been drained by an underabundance of the word or, or a dearth of the word underabundance. I don't think that's that's really the right word there. Anyway, sometimes words are hard, right? That being said, we've got to be careful that we don't if we that we don't study the Bible for the sake of the Bible. Now, what do you mean by that? Why do you study the Bible? In fact, I want you to put that in the comments. Somebody give me an answer on that. Why do you study the Bible? What is your motivation? What makes you go to the Word? Why do you study the Bible? While you're looking at that, we're gonna while you're throwing those in there, I'm gonna go to another scripture quickly. How shall a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not allow me to wander from your commandments. All right. How shall a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not allow me to wander from your commandments. Now, why do you read your Bible? What are you doing? What's the purpose of reading the Bible? See, I've got one answer in here already because it's a guide. It's a guide. Absolutely. In fact, the psalmist tells us it's a light to my path. That That's good. Let's see here. We've got some other answers coming in. Dan Hollinsworth says to keep my heart in check with Jesus. Sandra Hannon says to know God better. And let's see here. Raymond Klepper says to learn about God. That is, if is if this is Cecil Klepper on here, um, I might. I think the Kleppers are watching together, so we uh, we might have to give credit to the wife if you're like me, Cecil. Sometimes my wife comes up with better answers than I do. <laughs> Chris. Christine Jacobs says it keeps my walk right and keeps me close to the Lord. Kim Williams says to learn more about God, to draw closer to God. Nancy says to have a relationship with God. And Sandra Hannon says to keep away from sin. You know, at the end of the day, and I like, I'm going to throw Ms. Nancy's back up there to have a relationship with God. And there's a lot of people that put things similar to that. In fact, Kim kind of gives us a, a, both answers to learn more about him and to draw closer to him. And so that's a, that's a good answer. Um, and here's the thing. Let's look at what the psalmist says, because the psalmist is going to give us an idea where he says, watch this with my whole heart. Well, first of all, how does a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. That's how we live right. It's how we avoid sin, as Sandra Hannon said. That's how uh, Christine says, keep my walk right. Dan says, keep my heart in check. Okay, we do all those things. We understand that. That's all valuable, right? But watch this. It says, with my whole heart, I seek you. Do not allow me to wander from your commandments. 
We have to be careful that when we're reading the Word, we're not reading the Word for the sake of the Word, just to know more about the Word, to be a better scholar, but to actually know God. Every day when, when I open up my morning and I begin by getting in this literal Bible right here, when I open up that Bible and I get into the Word, I'm not just knowing the Word better. I'm not going there looking for a sermon. Sometimes a sermon will come out of my personal devotion time, but my personal devotion time is my personal devotion time. It's not where I'm going to look to find something to teach or find something to, to post or find something to uh, tell you guys about. I want to know God. I want to have a relationship with Him. I want to know what he has to say. And so this verse tells us a lot of things. First of all, it tells us we stay away from sin when we stay in the word. It also tells us that we're looking for God in the word. And here's the thing. The more we review, we look at the word, it's like James talks about that mirror. The more we see God through the word, the more we're going to recognize sin or wrongdoing in our life. It's kind of like Isaiah He's in Isaiah chapter 6, and he sees God high and lifted up. Well, the first thing he recognizes is his own inadequacy. When you look at the Word, it'll begin to show you things about yourself that need to change. And here's the thing. Sin will keep you from the Word, or the Word will keep you from sin. Oftentimes, people begin to neglect the Word because they know things in their life are not right, or because they're blinded to what the Word says because their spirit is not in the right place to be receiving of the word, right? Let's look at Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 is that famous verse about presenting our bodies, but We see here that we overcome the world by the transforming that happens through the renewing of our mind. And so here we see the power of having your mind focused on the things of God. And this happens through devotions. Through What do you mean when you say devotions? I mean Bible reading and prayer. That's where this happens, through studying the things of God. As we see God in His Word, our minds become renewed. They become focused on heavenly things instead of earthly things. And we begin to understand His will. There's things that I've had people come to me and ask me, and they go, hey, what do you think about such and such? And in the moment, I couldn't think of the scripture that necessarily exactly fit, but because we understand the nature of God through all of our understanding of scripture, go, ah, that doesn't seem right. Well, then you go study it out and you come to find out, absolutely, you were correct. Well, how do you know it didn't seem right? Because you know the nature of God, because you've spent time with him. You've read his word. You've heard his heart. You know how God thinks about things. You know what God desires. All of these things are so valuable for us. Now, I I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, how their devotional life is boring or how it's dry or, or how it's stale and how they don't know how people can do it. They don't understand how that happens, right? They don't understand, Pastor, why, how do you possibly get so much out of the Word? I don't even, I don't even like reading. I don't even like it. And they, it gets boring to them, all right? I, I do want to say this. you got to make sure, make sure when you're reading the Bible that you're reading a version that you can understand. Now, make sure you're reading a reputable version of the Scriptures, all right? But there's some, some that you may like because you might like the way they sound. You might like them because you grew up on them. But some are hard to read. And if it's hard to read, it's going to be hard for you to grasp. It's going to be hard for you to grasp. So so be careful with that. Make sure you've got something that's easy to read, but also a reputable translation of God's Word. Now, I want to show you something, though, about when our devotion life begins to get dry, begins to get tasteless. Let's look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 31. The house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed, and it was white, and its taste was like wafers made with honey. Now, what's it taste like? It tastes like honey. Well, that sounds that sounds pretty good, right? Wafers with honey? All right. Now, watch this. A little while later, in Numbers, the manna was as coriander seed, and it looked like delium. The people went about and gathered it, and ground it in mills, or beat it in a mortar, and boiled it in pots, and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked in oil. It went from being this sweet wafer taste to the taste of something, just something, some kind of deep fried bread cake of their time or baked oil 
That doesn't sound quite as good, doesn't sound quite as delectable as the honey. So what changed the taste of the manna? Did, did Heaven's Chef change the process by, by which it was being put together? Did God change what he was giving them? Well, see, something had happened with the people of Israel. Somewhere along the way, they had started to remember Egypt. They had started to think about the things of Egypt, and when they did, it caused the manna to lose its sweetness. They got their minds on Egypt, which is a type and example of the world, rather than on the God that provided them their daily bread. And next thing you know, it didn't taste so good. And here's the thing. When you begin to get your eyes on the on the things of this world, even though you still eat the word, maybe you say I'm still having devotions, but it loses its draw when you begin to think about the things of the world. When you fill yourself with the filth of this world that we live in, you'll find yourself pulling further and further and further from wanting to read God's word and from getting anything out of it. So what had actually happened to them? Well, what had happened is they had they had become a multitude of people that had pagan people among them. They had people that didn't know God, didn't love God, and they, they, they found themselves in a place where they themselves had lost their desire for the things of God because they were so caught up in remembering Egypt and then being involved in these relationships with these pagan people. So we see the pain, well, we see the danger of what worldliness will do to our desire for the things of God. Your flesh is always going to love the things of the world. Your flesh is always going to be put in its place. And so what happens is we find ourselves feeding on the things of the world, then suddenly we don't want to read the Word. Suddenly getting into a next chapter of the Word, suddenly exploring the things of God doesn't seem as pleasant as that next Netflix binge or doesn't seem as pleasant as going out with your friends or whatever it is. We, we get caught up in earthly carnal things, both sinful things and things that are simply of this world. And when we do, we find ourselves losing the taste for the things of heaven. That's the thing, though. Watch again. Remember, the children of Israel were, had lost their taste, but in the meantime, they had begun to mingle with people that were not God's people. And that shows us something. Let's look at this scripture. It shows us the danger of relationships. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. See, the Israelites that departed Egypt, they didn't understand this. They didn't pay attention to this. They didn't know this. Or, or they didn't. They weren't keeping this principle. They found themselves mixed up with all sorts of the wrong people. And next thing you know, they begin to desire what the people around them, what the pagan people wanted, rather than desiring the things of God. And it's the same way with us. If you run with the wrong folks, you you here's the thing. You'll start hearing what they talk about. You'll start hearing the stuff they do. The stuff they say will begin to start making sense. It's it's. Psalm chapter 1, all over again, We first we find ourselves uh, walking in their way, then we find ourselves sitting with them, right? We, for we find ourselves standing, we slow down, we begin to hang out, then we find ourselves seated in the seat of the scorner. How in the world does this happen? Well, there's an old saying that you may have heard about running with dogs. It seems like when you run with dogs, you wind up with something. It's kind of like that with immorality. When you run with immorality, it will begin to affect you. Now, somebody says, how do you balance this? How do you balance this with uh, being a, an, an effective witness? Look, there is a huge difference between being friendly, being kind, being an effective witness, and finding yourself having uh, your closest relationships being people who are, who are just have a totally different way of viewing things. At the end of the day, I didn't write the scripture I can just read it to you. And the scripture says here, of course, bad company corrupts good morals, but also how can two walk together unless they agree? How can you have, how, here's the thing. When you begin to seek the things of God, friends will begin to drop off. People will begin to disappear. People are not going to pursue that relationship with you. When you find yourself seeking after God, you will find yourself, um, people people of like interests come together. Another saying, of course, birds of a feather, right? Birds of a feather flock together. Birds of a feather, people that are the same will draw together. As you begin to seek God, the closer you get to God, the closer you'll get to people that are getting closer to God, right? You'll find yourself getting there. And But if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves running with the wrong crowd, listening to their things. And here's the thing. Your friends will affect you, all right? If you go to get a job 
and you make friends when you go in and you sit down at the lunch table. I can remember times as a manager when I would see somebody, a new employee come in and I could tell by the people they made friends with in the first week or two, whether or not they were going to be successful. Because there are people that are negative. There are people that are always uh, looking for the wrong in things. There are people who didn't have the real work ethic. There are people who were kind of trouble. And so whenever, and I'm sure you've probably seen that in job situations and so on and so forth. People become groups. They become the negative group, whatever. It affects their work ethic because the people that they connected to. Listen, your friends will affect your marriage. I cannot tell you the times I have seen marriages affected because a husband or wife became close friends with people that did not value marriage. I have seen marriages destroyed because a man who, who loved his family began to hang out with people that didn't love theirs. And so instead of being home with his wife, he's out with his buddies all the time and they're putting pressure on him to not be with his family. Or this wife would begin to hang out with somebody and this person didn't have a good relationship or maybe their relationship had come apart. And so they began to tell her, I'm not going to let no man. I'm not going to ask nobody for anything. I'm not going to. Right. And next thing you know, that woman begins to feel resentment for her husband because of the people she's around. And suddenly a wedge gets driven because of the people that are there. And we've got there is there are few things that are more dangerous than the people that we are around. It will affect your, again, your work ethic. It will affect your marriage. It will affect your money handling. You get around people, you start listening to what they do, seeing the way they do things, you begin to become like them. It'll affect your church attendance. You get around people that don't value the things of God, you'll find yourself not valuing the things of God. It'll affect your parenting. Well, they're doing it this way. Well, they're letting their kids do this. Well, they're not making their kid do that. Well, they're not putting this pressure on their child or they're putting more pressure in this area or that thing. And next thing you know, your parenting is affected by the people you're around. So we have to understand something again and again and again. We see the influence of friends, friends and acquaintances and the people we hang out with. It's powerful. So what do we do? Let's look at the scripture. Proverbs 4.14, do not enter the path of the wicked and do not go into the way of evil men. All right, that seems to be pretty simple. Avoid their way, avoid their path. Does that mean you have to avoid them completely? No. Does that mean you can't be kind or friendly? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But here's the thing. That stuff will affect you. And here we go. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a principle here. In fact, Deborah White just put what you put in will come out. Absolutely. That's a principle we've been talking about for weeks and what you allow to come into you through friendships, relationships, it will come out of you, right? So don't enter the path of the wicked. Don't go in the way of evil men. Do not be envious against evil men, nor desire to be with them. Now, what's that mean? Obviously we understand don't go their path. Don't do things their way. Don't don't do that, but don't be envious. What's it? Well, here's the thing. We can look at people in the world and we go, man, they're not following these principles, but they seem to be doing well. They're not, they're not, they're not following God's principles and things seem to be working out. Or boy, they seem to be happy, pleasing themselves. Well, first of all, you don't see all the truth that's happening behind some behind the scenes in someone's life. But it says being envious, sometimes it seems like they're getting away. Understand something. We know the end of the story. We know the heartache that comes in this life, and we know the separation from God that comes after death on this earth, nor desire to be with them. So here's the thing. If if we want to escape from this thinking again, we have to remember God's justice. God doesn't, God sometimes the wheels of God's justice may grind slow, thank goodness. And sometimes God will let people go for a long time before he reckons with them. But here's the thing, when he does judge, boy, what a day that is. And you don't want to be on the wrong side of that. And now we're going to look more at friendships and relationships in another study that will be coming up soon. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But but let's talk about, or of good relationships, we're going to talk about that. But I want to take a moment, I want to talk about just a couple of the benefits of what happens with the wise. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. We've read this text already, this Proverbs 13, 20. We've read it already through this study. But we see here that walking with the wise will make you wise. And then iron sharpens iron, Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Our friends will strengthen us, all right? Iron sharpening iron. So we see that. Now, 
I, I do want to take a moment and get back over to Timothy. Let's see here. And Timothy, or I want to talk about Timothy for just a second. Remember, Timothy was shaped in his home, right? We remember that. He was shaped by mom and grandma. That, that affected his life. Watch what the scripture says, Proverbs 24. Through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms will be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Now, it sounds like a good home, right? It's established. The rooms are filled. Things are going well. It's affluent. How does this happen? Well, it happens through wisdom. All right. Now, here's the thing, though. Walking in wisdom and shaping your home is a choice. Glorifying God in your home life is a choice. And every day you make that choice. Let's look at let's look at a text here. Let's see here. Joshua 24, 15. If it is displeasing to you to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. If it should be the gods your father served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites land where you're now living, yet as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Just choose who's going to be your God. Choose who you're going to serve. Glorifying God in your home life is a choice. Every single day, you're going to get up and make that choice. Every time you have a disagreement, you're going to choose, hey, we're going to handle this like believers. Every time you're picking entertainment or destinations for your family to go, you're choosing, we're going to glorify God. Every time you begin to train your young men and your young women in the way they should carry themselves, in the way they should dress, and the way they should be entertained and the stuff they should listen to. You're making a decision. Are we going to glorify God? Every day is a choice. Every single day. Every time we set our priorities and we determine what's going to matter to this family, we're making a choice. Every single day. And so here's the thing. We, we need strong homes. We know that. Our nation needs strong homes. Our church needs strong homes. We have to understand Satan is always looking for an inroad, right? He's always looking for an inroad. So let's just see what the scripture says. Let's look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober and watchful because your adversary the devil walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him firmly in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are experienced by your brotherhood through the world. Now, What's he say? He says, first of all, he says we need to be sober. He says we need to be sober. We need to be serious. Here's the thing, guys. This is a serious thing that we're dealing with. Living the Christian life is serious business. We're, we're talking about eternity. That's why it matters. So he says, I don't have time to do this stuff with my kids. You don't have time not to. I don't have the energy to get my kids involved in church. You don't have time not to. You don't have the energy not to. It's the most important thing we could do. We're talking about eternity, so be sober. Watch this next thing. He says, be sober and be watchful. Be watchful. You got to be wary. You got to have your eye on what the enemy's doing. You got to be paying attention. Pay attention to what's coming into your house. Pay attention to what's coming into your life. Pay attention to the to the subliminal messaging that's going on in the in the entertainment that you're taking in. What are they saying? What is the ethos behind this stuff? What are people operating in? Pay attention to it. You got to make sure you're watchful because the enemy the enemy walks around as a roaring lion and he's coming. He's coming. You got to be careful. You got to make sure you're paying attention to what he's doing. It is very, very serious. You got to be watchful. What happened? What's happening with my kids? What are they listening to? Who are their friends? Look, you get one chance to raise your babies. You get one chance to raise your kids. You get one chance to do that. You get one chance to have never messed up the marriage. You get one chance at so many things. Now, I know God redeems. I know God brings back. But the damage that has been done, you will reap and reap and reap from what you sow. So be watchful. I see so many people overwhelmed by sin because they're just not careful. They're just not watchful. They don't want to take the extra three minutes before watching a movie. Sometimes it might, if we, hey, 
my, my wife will say to me, hey, you want to you find a movie tonight? It might take me 15 minutes because I'm going to read some reviews. I'm going to find out what's in it. It costs my family an extra $10 a month because we use VidAngel to get rid of things. Yeah, absolutely. But we're sober about this thing. We're watchful about this thing because at the end of the day, we are dealing with eternity, eternity of our souls and the souls of our children. Church, we've got to be serious and we've got to be watchful. I would not have you ignorant, the scripture says, concerning the devices of Satan. We've got to have we got to have our eyes wide open. We got to be looking for where the enemy's coming in. We got to be on the watchtower. We got to be seeing where is he moving in. Recently, there was a movie that came out, and in that movie, this is the way they work. And I know there's a lot of things that happen that people try to advance and say that there's something there, and sometimes there might be, sometimes there might not be. But there was a movie that came out not long ago, and in that movie, there was a character that was living a lifestyle that I'm not going to I'm going to teach my children about but I'm going to teach them as not pleasing to God and it was just subliminal in one part where the character spoke about the relationship they were in it was a kids movie I made the decision not us not this house not going to do it why because I'm going to protect them I'm going to be watchful but there's also other things there might be world views listen there are people out there there are so-called clean things out there that make a mockery of marriage that make a mockery of fatherhood, that make a mockery of leading the home, that make a mockery of good Christian values. You better be watchful. You better be watchful. What's happening in your life? What's going on in your emotions? What's happening? What's happening in that home? You better be watchful. You better be sober. You better be serious. Why? Because the enemy, the enemy is going around like a roaring lion, the scripture says, seeking whom he may devour. I, I want to look at a couple of things here. Watch this. Why? Yeah, here, here's that answers the question. Why do I need to be serious? Why do I need to be watchful? Because the adversary, the devil, I got to watch out for him. This is serious business. We're playing for keeps. Let's look at another verse, James 4, verse 7. I've already got that one on the line for you. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil. There's the answer. How do you overcome? Submit to God, resist the devil. Submit to God, resist to de- resist the devil. How do you submit to God? Well, the things that you know to do right, do them. The things that you know God has said, follow God's way. That's how you submit to God. How do you resist the devil? Well, you resist the devil by when the enemy begins to come in with in thought, he begins to come in in temptation, begins to come against you. You resist the devil by not doing that. You resist the devil by rebuking the thing. You resist the devil by being prepared for that, by seeing it for what it is. Submit to what God's will is. Resist the plan of the enemy. Submit to God's plan. Resist the enemy's plan. Right? How do I know what God's plan is? You get in the word. You listen to to, to the teaching and preaching of the word. You spend time in prayer and Bible study. Submit yourself to God. And then resist the devil. Here's the thing. Some people think they're going to resist the devil, but they're not submitted to God. You can't fight the enemy unless you're submitted to God. You're not going to be able to overcome him just because you think you got willpower. Oh, no, friend, that doesn't work. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You're too weak to overcome on your own, but when you submit to God, God's strength comes alongside you, and then you find yourself enveloped in him, and God overcomes. But you're not, listen, people think you're going to defeat the enemy. You're not going to defeat the enemy. You really think you're going to be able to give your kids or grandkids advice about life and you've not been spending time in the word? Satan's been doing this for thousands of years. Evil has worked against God. Rebellion has been in the hearts of men since the first man and woman. They found themselves in rebellion. You really think you're going to navigate life without God's word? You really think you're going to give good advice without God's word? You really think you're going to be able to plan your life out without spending time with God? You understand when we ref- when we don't pray and read, every day that you don't get into your Bible, and every day that you don't spend time with God is a day that you're saying, God, I don't need you today. That's what you're saying. Pastor, I don't have time. You don't have time not to. You don't have time not to. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Here's the thing. Pastor, what's all that do for us? Well, what all that does for us is it helps us to guard that home. Home is where the heart is. 
And we guard our home by guarding our heart. We guard our home by guarding our heart. And we guard our heart by guarding our home. It's mutually beneficial. So if we're going to walk in wisdom, we better make sure we're doing these things. We better make sure we're submitting to God and resisting the devil. I wanted to take a few minutes tonight and just talk to you about how powerful your home life is and how you've got to make a decision that at home, I'm going to glorify God. And how do I know I'm going to glorify God at home? I know I'm going to glorify God at home by making sure I've got a devotional life in my home. I'm going to glorify my life before God by making sure that I watch my relationships within my home and outside of the home. I'm going to make sure that I do all I can to seek God. Dan Hollinsworth, you are absolutely right. He says, you've got to make time. You have to make time. And that's exactly it. You have to make time for the things of God. Here's the thing, guys. Either it matters or it doesn't. If it doesn't matter, we should all just close down this thing called Christianity and go and do whatever we want to do. But one thing we cannot do is be lukewarm because we know that doesn't work in the kingdom. How do I fill myself with wisdom? I get into the word. I get into the things of God, and I go find myself walking in wisdom. I want to thank you guys for joining us tonight. Father, I pray you'd be with them. Help them to walk in your word. Walk in your truth to know you better. Father, I pray that every home will be a home that is strong in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you all. It has been so good to see you on tonight. We will see you Sunday morning in church, and we're going to have hopefully some information about children's ministry coming soon. Stay tuned for that. God bless you all. We will see you this Sunday morning, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 9 a.m., 11 a.m. Obviously, the 11 a.m. service will be live online. I sure would love to see as many of you as you can get there in the live service. But if you're still not comfortable getting out, you got people that are at risk and so on and so forth. We want you to stay in that online campus. That's what it's for. God bless you all. We will see you Sunday.